So my Hamilton 212 reverse bucket was becoming difficult to operate. This means it was difficult to get into forward, difficult to get into reverse, and because it was difficult to get into reverse, it's also difficult to stop quickly. All of this was quite irritating, somewhat sporadic and unpredictable, so I would never know for sure whether I would be able to uh, go forward or reverse or stop. Other people have reported similar problems, so I thought I would investigate and document my efforts. Here you can see the bucket moving up and down, and in the prior clip you could see a spring that helped it stay up when it's up. Here you can see the Hamilton 212 brake box. Its job is to let the operator raise and lower the bucket, but also hold the bucket in place so the bucket can't move by itself. And here's the last piece of the Hamilton 212 bucket control system which is the control lever at the helm. This is actually a single lever control, so there's just one lever that runs both the bucket and the throttle. It's more common to have two levers where there's a separate lever for each, one that runs the throttle and one that runs the bucket up and down. So things that I observe here aren't necessarily going to be uh, appropriate for everybody, but they are at least sort of appropriate for the single lever control. So here's your basic brig box, and I've got a bungee cord attached to this side. It's pretending to be resistance from the bucket. That's where the bucket lever arm attaches, is right here. And you'll note that despite some tension in this bungee cord, the brake box is not moving. So it's holding position. If I reach in here and push with my fingers, then I can slide it or I can make it go the other way. So the bungee by itself won't do it because it's putting force only on this brass fitting. It's not affecting the ends of these locker things in here. So if I come in here, I can push on this locker thing just lightly. See what happens. Well, nothing happened. That's because it's locked down. Okay. How about this one? Come in here and push on these locker things. Let's try this one, see what happens. And the whole thing just moves very easily. Okay, let's do that again. So we'll push it out here. The bungee is tight, but nothing's happening. Now I'll grab on this. And that moved by itself. I, I wasn't moving it. I'm gonna do it with one finger. Let's see what happens. This is one finger. So the brake box does what it's supposed to. It keeps the bucket from causing motion. So the bucket can't move as long as this brake box is here. But the question is, people see a lot of resistance in the bucket mechanism for the Hamilton 212, and you see a lot of them going to hydraulic. So what's the impetus there? If this thing was working perfectly all the time, there wouldn't be an issue, and people wouldn't be going to a hydraulic reverse but they are. So my goal here was to dig in a little deeper and figure out what's actually going on. Now some people might jump in here and say, no, wait a minute, the real reason people are going to a hydraulic reverse is simply because they can't get into reverse when they're at throttle. The reason being is that there's a lot of hydraulic resistance to lowering the bucket. There's flow through the jet pump, and then there's water that you're dragging along behind the boat, and both of those make it very difficult to lower the bucket. As a consequence, they go to hydraulic, and there's really nothing else you can do. So I decided to uh, devise a test to find out whether this thinking is correct or not. Is that force really as big as is being implied, or is there something else going on? And here I have some chain hanging from the bucket. So I've got the vice grips up there and the clothes hanger and then a few pounds of chain. And our goal here is to see how difficult this makes the helm. And 
whether or not we can make the helm a lot easier by squirting lubricant in opportune places. So another thing to consider is how high is this, how far is the chain going to move compared to the lever at the helm? If, if the lever moves a long way and this doesn't move very far, then the lever has a lot of leverage over it. And the bucket actually only moves from about here down to there. So, you know, eight inches. Now we'll go look at the helm and uh, see if it makes it a lot more difficult or not. So here we are at the helm. And it turns out the top of this lever here has a little bit more throw than the bucket moves, so it has a little bit of uh, mechanical advantage over the chain that's on the bucket. So let's pull this and see what happens. Now we're going into reverse, so this should be really easy because of all that chain hanging off the back. And you see it's catching. And it's binding even with all that chain. Without the chain, it wasn't binding. Now let's try to go forward. It's like... Urgh. Now that's just barely moving. I can make it go. But that's a full push-up at least. Probably more. I've got half my weight on there, so you know, you could guess what that might be for an American. Somewhere between, well half my weight would be somewhere between say 70 pounds and 400 pounds. So it's at least 70 pounds of pressure and it's just barely moving. And that's just with a few pounds of chain hanging off the back. So somewhere in the system there's a whole lot of resistance being created. This also suggests that the hydraulic resistance to lowering the bucket may actually be very small and only equivalent to a few pounds of chain. So the actual resistance could be low and it's simply being amplified by the control system somehow. And now I've got the brake box di disconnected and the spring removed from the other side of the pump, on that side of the pump, and we'll see whether this is easy to move or not, just the, bu the bucket by itself. So I've got this vice grip over here, and I'm pretending I'm the, uh, the lever on the inside. I might be putting, you know, well, here's a pinky, I've got a pinky in there. And I can move that up and down really easily, it's really easy to move. Now when it when it gets up to the top like this, you can see this, this line for this lever coming through this point. It's, it's actually through this, it passes over this rotation point. So now it's cammed over. So if I try to pull down here, I'm actually pulling through this, point, this rotation point here. And there's basically no leverage. So if I lift up on the bucket, I can lift up on that as hard as I want and it doesn't move. So the way this is designed is because of this cam over point up here, this bucket, once it's down, it's going to stay down. It can't blow up. But if I just shake a little bit, then boom, up it goes. So probably that's what was happening in the original design was you're having a guy in reverse, the bucket jiggles around a bit, and all of a sudden, boom, in a heartbeat, he's in full forward instead of full reverse which is bad, so they create the, the brake box and all the problems that happen along with that. So here I've modified this brake box thingy. Uh, remo removed the locker dealy bobs, so one of these went in on, on each side here. Those are gone. So now this thing just moves back and forth like this. And then on, on the other side, this, this is the side that attaches to the uh, reverse bucket lever. Um, these locker guys fit in here and so I had to fill in this space because the locker's not there anymore and I had to fill in the space uh, with a little bit longer bolt and then I kind of locked it down so there's one on each side. So it's pretty easy. This kind of flaps around but once the whole thing is bolted in it'll be pretty much stuck in place. So now it just does that. And the whole thing still moves back and forth. And if I grab a hold of this thing, I can, I can move it. It doesn't lock. My theory here is that by removing the locker plates, the brake box won't jam up and everything will move smoothly. This does carry with it a safety issue because 
without the locker plates, then the bucket is free to move on its own. So it may fly up when it's in reverse, or it may drop down when in forward. But I don't know that for sure. So I'm going to find out, because I'd really like to know why this whole thing is jamming up. Okay, so here I am with my modified brake box installed. So let's see what this really means. In this position, I'm, the bucket is up, and without a brake box, theoretically, I should be able to push that bucket down very easily. And that was only partially true. I probably put 10 pounds of force on it to get it to go. Then once it starts moving, then it gets easier. Let's try it again. Now I've moved it all the way to the bottom. So theoretically without the brake box, uh, the only thing keeping it in place is the cam over that's up here. But from our previous video, we know that that's really not cammed over far enough to keep this bucket down. So let's see what happens if I lift on it. See, it's moving there, but the bucket's not going anywhere. So the question is, why not? Certainly that's handy, because that means the bucket isn't going to blow up on accident. And when it's up, and it's difficult to get started, that means it's not going to fall down on accident. So the question is, why are these handy things happening? And the answer is, in the helm. Because this is a single, single lever helm, it gives us a certain amount of cam over. So let's go take a look. Okay, here we are at the helm. Although it has two handles, it's actually a, a, a single lever control. This is the stock handle. I didn't really like that, so I added this one. I made it so that when I'm driving down the river, my hand is up rather than being cocked down on, on the stock handle. So here we are in full reverse. And you can see what happens. The uh, this over here is the is the throttle linkage, so you can see I'm I'm in full reverse, and the reverse comes off. Here you can see the bucket really hasn't moved. This this thing rotates, but this length doesn't shorten, so the throttle's all the way off. Then the bucket starts to raise. There's the neutral detent on the back. I just I can feel that. I push through it. Now I'm all the way forward in full throttle. There you can see the, the throttle linkage moving there. So it's just moving for part of the part of the throw. So most of the throw is actually doing the shifting. So from about here to there, that's raising and lowering the bucket. So when I'm in full reverse. And you can look down in here, and there's this pivot point right here. And this thing has come across that pivot point, so it's cammed over. So when you're in reverse, if the cable tries to shorten, nothing's going to happen. It's just cammed over. So it can't throw itself back up. So that's why the cam over on the pump itself doesn't really need to be functional. The control here, which is actually quite clever, uh, keeps you in reverse. So that aspect of the brake box, uh, keeping the, the bucket from flying up accidentally, is, is taken care of by, the, by this control system. Okay, now let's look at the forward and why there's a cam over and forward. And it has to do with this linkage in here. So here I'm in, f in full throttle forward. And it turns out I, I went and checked the bucket, and if I'm in full throttle, then it is cammed over and I cannot move the bucket down regardless of how hard I push on it. So what happens when you move the lever is this guy moves first, and that's moving the throttle linkage, but it's really not moving this much. And this is what has to move for the bucket to fall. So it's in a cammed over position because this tries to lengthen, it's going to actually come in on this stop right here and stop the thing from camming over further. So that's your positive cam stop. 
It won't go any further than that, and if you try to pull down on, on this, it's just going to pull into that. So if I'm at part, part throttle though, then it will tend to rotate around this pivot point. So here I'd be at an idle, and so um, there is some sort of cam over protection, but it's, you know, it's, it's not the full thing when at idle. Yeah, I'm not sure when it would be full, probably right in about there. So, uh, you know, you'd have to have, you know, I don't know, 2,500 or 3,000 RPM maybe, and then it would, uh, um, the bucket would not be able to fall. So it will tend to fall just a, it will try to fall just a little bit, but there is some resistance in the system. So it, it has a feel that it's, well, it's just going to kind of stay there. The neutral detent is really strong. There's also a slight detent. You can see this, this, this little bump right here. That's a reverse detent. So kind of reverse neutral. And then there's a similar one for the forward neutral. So it'll kind of keep itself in place. So anyway, it looks like this single lever control thing is actually very clever and it takes care of some of the problems that the brake box, the very jammy brake box was supposed to take care of and didn't. Or, or did so and also made the brake box jam. So the next step is a water test. See how this works. If things happen unexpectedly, uh, will it stay in neutral? I don't use, really use neutral at all. Um, I suppose people that idle around docks would, but I typically don't idle around docks. I'm usually on, on rivers, and so I'm either putting the boat on or off the trailer, or driving it down the river, or pulling it nose first onto a beach, and so I, I don't need to be in neutral then, or pulling it off of a beach, and then I'm not in neutral in that situation either. So I really don't spend any time in neutral, but it could be that other people may. So water test is next. So I went out for a river test with the locker thingies removed on the brake box and recall this is the setup. You can see the lockers are gone and here, here's a stock setup where the lockers are present. You can see how they set in there. And the, uh, this bolt thingy presses against the lockers and that's why this, this guy moves back and forth. And with my revised setup, I put these bolts in here to take up the, the slack where the, the lockers are gone. Now, the results of this test were that it was actually more difficult to move the brake box with this setup than with this setup. So that implies that these lockers are not to blame. They're not the thing that's making it stiff. There's something else here that's making it stiff. So what is it really? Well, a difference is that with these bolts like this, the contact, the contact point for this, this guy that actually moves the uh, bucket lever, the contact point is down here a little way. So it's moving, it's contacting down there. And when the lockers are present, the contact point is up here just a little higher. So what that implies is there's actually a little, slightly more rotational torque on the slider bar transmitted through this, uh, this brass piece when there's a force of resistance on the brake bucket. So you can see, let's get it, zoom in close so you can actually see that this guy actually wiggles back and forth. It doesn't actually slide back and forth precisely on the bar. It actually rotates just a little bit. So that little bit of rotation is taking up some slop against this slider, which implies that there's friction points at either side of the, of the brass fitting. So that's really what's happening. Is this brass fitting is having trouble sliding on this guy because there's a rotational torque and that rotational torque was, became more obvious when the contact point is lower on the brass fitting there than it is here. So that's why it got worse. So that tells us that actually it's force transmitted from the bucket 
through this brake box that's causing this brass fitting to lock up on the slider bar. Now here's another interesting point. Right here is where the cable attaches. So the cable's pushing above the, the sliding axis. So whenever the cable's pushing or pulling, that implies actually that there's a rotational torque about the sliding axis and it has to be compensated for by this plastic piece and the plastic piece on the other side of the slider bar. So that means there's going to be a, a heavy friction contact point there as well. So there's two contact points on, pl on the plastic thingies and then there's going to be two contact points on this brass fitting and it's all due to rotational torque that's created by this brake box. So to investigate the resistance generated by the brake box, I decided to do a little testing. Here you can see my super high-tech test apparatus. This is a stock brake box, the stock setup on the slider. Here's a bungee cord for a little bit of resistance. And the cable comes in and attaches here and pushes like that. Now the brake box is doing its job because despite this bungee cord pulling, this guy doesn't slide back. But if I reach in here and release this little uh, locker thingy, then boom, it slides back. So there it is again. Stays in place. Release the locker. And it comes back. So we know the locker is doing its job. So at least in this way, it's working as designed. So now I need a way to measure the force that I'm applying with the screwdriver relative to the force that's in the bungee cord. If the bungee cord force is very low compared to the screwdriver force, then my theory will be correct about the rotational torque that's in this brass fitting and in the plastic things on the slider. So here's my crude force measurement apparatus. I've got five pounds of weight dangling from this bungee cord. So now I know how long the bungee cord has to be to exert five pounds of force. Then I just have to match that length on the test apparatus and I'll know that I've got five pounds of force through the bungee. Now I've got the green bungee cord hanging on to the bucket bolt. And I'm going to pull against it with a yellow bungee cord and then we'll know approximately how much force the cable would have to exert to stretch that green bungee cord. And I'm pulling and pulling. Seems like more than five pounds. I'm still pulling, 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 pulling. Pulling, holy crap, I'm pulling a lot. Still not moving. Oh, there it's starting to go. Okay. Okay, now I'll get a length on that. And that is 69 inches. So now we want to hang weights from this yellow bungee until it's 69 inches long and we'll know how much force it was to move this thing. So here's my test apparatus with the yellow bungee cord. Goes up to this uh, chain up here on this board. That's 69 inches and that's 12 and a half pounds. So I was pulling with 12 and a half pounds against five pounds of resistance. So that means the brake box was generating seven and a half pounds of resistance. Now to be fair, this isn't uh, a hundred percent representative of the stock configuration. This uh, bungee is hooked a little way out here on this bolt where the lever on the bucket is actually closer in and then the uh, the yellow bungee was hooked over the top of this rather than just poking in here so that kind of increased its its rotational torque as well but it kind of demonstrates the idea 
that the brake box magnifies resistive forces in the bucket arm. So now that we did this for five pounds, let's look at something a little bit more, like 10 pounds, and see what happens. So rather than bore you with showing you the actual test, I'll just tell you what the results were. To overcome 10 pounds of force in the green bungees required 25 pounds of force in the yellow bungees. So in both cases it required 2.5 times the resistive force to move the brake box. And as I said before, this number isn't an exact number. In the, in the real world it's going to be something different than this. But it does show that the brake box does generate some resistance. So here we are looking at the lever for the brake bucket. And if this is super duper hard to move, then we'll know that there's something in the linkage that's jamming things up. So let's see, well, is it? No, it's not super duper hard to move. Surprise, surprise, oh look, I can move it with one finger. That's really easy, two fingers, yeah. Let's see if I can do it with a pinky. Uh, pinky strength, almost, oh, oh, pinky can do it, okay. But yeah, one finger can do it. So that's really easy. It shouldn't be hard at all. And this cable. Yeah, I don't know if I can actually pull it and make it move because the lever at the helm actually weighs a bit. No, oh, there I can make it go that way. I can push it in. Yeah. It's hard to pull out, maybe. Well, you can understand. Anyway, uh, so this shouldn't be hard. You know, that's just a few pounds of force that I'm putting there. Something I didn't uh, represent in my test setup is that the bucket lever needs to be free to move in this position. This is where it attaches. If it's not free to move, then this brass guy is going to bind on this slider. So I set this little thing up where I bolted in this plate to represent the bucket lever and then hung this uh, chain from it so that I get some torque onto this uh, brass fitting. And what do you know, that made it a lot more difficult. I didn't take the time to uh, do my bungee cord force test, but you know, you can set it up yourself if you want to see. Uh, it makes it a lot more difficult. So that's just something that I didn't include in my test setup. So given that my uh, test setup actually made things worse, I decided to try something completely different and completely remove the slider. So the slider guy is gone, it's gone, and I replaced it with just this bolt. So the cable attaches here, and then this thing still attaches to the, uh, to the bucket arm. So this guy all moves back and forth just like a regular cable end attachment. So it's free to move. Uh, it, this was really smooth moving in the shop, but I didn't take it out for a river test because there's actually sort of a flaw in this. Because the cable attaches there, and the rotation point is, is a little bit lower, then the, the cable is going to tend to want to twist right here at the end if there's much resistance in the brake bucket. So that tendency to twist early on, it probably wouldn't be a problem, but after a, a bunch of fatigue or if I really have to push on the cable hard, then it'll work the end of that cable and uh, maybe bend it back and forth and then it'll snap off. So I just thought that was a dumb idea. You know, but I did prove in the shop that, yeah, this was, this was really easy to move. So then I thought about, well, how about one of these? Just get a one of these little spherical ball things with a stud out of it and attach that. Well, it turned out the stud was too short because there was too many washers and things that needed to be put on here uh, to attach to the bucket arm. So instead I ended up with this guy. So there's the cable end. And it's a 5 uh, 24 thread. And then uh, two of these heavy washers and then the bucket arm fits between those heavy washers. And I've got this collar in here and I've got to grind that down a bit so that it's the same thickness as the bucket arm. 
and then I'll install this and see what happens. Here's the simplified setup and it's all installed and functioning uh, in the shop here. It's not as much of an improvement as I had hoped for. It is, it definitely is some, but the system still is a little bit stiff going into forward. Uh, you know, hopefully it won't be bad getting into reverse. That's the main thing that I was having trouble with. It would just jam sometimes going into reverse. But getting into forward, if I hang, do the chain test, hang the chain from the bucket, it's still pretty darn hard. And it sort of implies that there's some resistance being built up somewhere else. So uh, I need to find that. It may be that it's in the extending part of the push on the push-pull cable. So when I'm pushing, it may generate force in a different way than when being pulled. Well, here I am in the engine compartment yet again. And now I've added some bungee cords to the bucket so that the bungee cords hold it up and I actually have to push to get the, the bucket to move down. And it turns out that at the helm it's now fairly difficult to get into reverse. But, you know, so then I think, well, then it should be difficult here, right? And it's like, no, it isn't. So the implication is that whatever force is being generated in the bucket is magnified a lot within the cable, whether it's pushing or pulling. So there's something going on in the cable, and that's the next thing I have to look at. Unfortunately, that's going to be a big job because I have to rip up the whole floor. Now I'm filming from outside of the engine compartment. I didn't feel like crawling down in there again. So here's the final setup. I modified this attachment point a little bit to raise it up and, and then turn that thing, turn the clamp so that the cable's in better alignment. It was kind of forced to be a little bit of a tight corner right there when there was the slider because it had to slide in a straight line. And now that I've got this uh, Well, bearing connector here, then I don't have to have that lined up perfectly. One thing I still might want to do is I noticed uh, online somebody mentioned that on the bolt side of this connector you want to put a big washer. That way if the bearing actually completely fails the washer will hold the thing together even though the bearing isn't working so then the connector will stay on the bolt at least. So now I've got this hooked up with the brake box removed and maybe a little bit of a tight spot in the cable straightened out. And the question everybody's going to have is, well, is it safe? And my feeling is yes, it, it is if, if it doesn't fly out of reverse and if it doesn't fly out of forward idle. And right now it's in a for, forward idle position with a bunch of chain hanging from it, you know, maybe five pounds of chain, I don't know. And it's not going anywhere. So the implication is the bucket doesn't want to fall on its own. Now if I reach out here and push on it a bit, add maybe 10 pounds, then it'll drop. And then recall from before that there's, there's some cam over here, but more importantly there's a lot of cam over at the helm. I'm going to take this chain off and try to raise the bucket. And that's not going anywhere. So that seems pretty safe to me. Uh, the one thing it won't hold is a neutral position, but I never use neutral. Um, when I start the boat, either I'm on the trailer or I'm nosed up to a beach. So it doesn't matter to me. And not being able to get neutral is a far smaller crime than not being able to get reverse when you really need it. Here I am back at the helm and recall that if I put some chain on the bucket then it made the helm much more difficult. Well that's a two-way street so I thought what I'd do is hang some chain so 
from this lever and see if that makes it so the uh, bucket is much less inclined to drop on its own. Let's go look. Okay, here I am back at the bucket. We're going to test this uh, theory and see what happens. And I'm leaning on the bucket. I'm really leaning on the bucket. So I probably got half my weight on the bucket. See, I'm bouncing it up and down. It's not going. So that little bit of chain added to the cam over that's present at the helm keeps the bucket from dropping. So now I've got, what, 200% safety? Well, now I'm out for a test drive. And there's the uh, throttle and uh, reverse bucket lever. And it's just sitting there. It's been sitting there for quite a while. It's not moving. So right now it's in forward idle. And I can move it back to more of a neutral position. I'm not sure where neutral is. I can't tell because I'm on the trailer still. But it just stays there too. So there's enough resistance in the system when it's in the water that it doesn't move. Yeah, it's not super solid, but it does but up here in up there in the forward neutral, it's or forward idle. It's just sitting there. I don't think it's going anywhere. And that's what we want. So now we'll take it out and drive around. Okay, I'm back from the test run and things are indescribably better. The only time I have trouble getting into reverse is when I'm dragging ass in the water. And that means the water would be coming up in this vicinity and I've got to actually drop the bucket into the water that's already behind the boat, never mind the uh, jet stream. But when I'm on plane, then the bucket is completely out of the water. First thing I do, because I have a single lever control, is drop throttle and then drop the bucket. And it's really easy. So for once, I'm able to actually use the reverse the way it should be used and I can do a power stop and that kind of stuff and turn in reverse and not have to worry about getting into reverse or back into forward or whatever. So the whole thing is working a lot better. There is still a um, difficulty getting into reverse when I'm dragging ass. I think that's still kind of overstated. Um, possibly the cable could be improved in some way, either the routing or the quality of the cable itself. I looked online and found that a typical multiplier for uh, input force versus output force is about a factor of two for a 360 degree bend. So uh, the fact that I can dangle five pounds of chain off the back of the bucket and have it be almost impossible to move the throttle at the helm implies that there's something else going on. So, um, so although it's a lot better now, there's still room for improvement. In the following video, you can see that the reverse bucket is completely out of the water when on plane. So if you cut throttle and then drop the bucket, the bucket will go down very easily. That's as long as you're still on plane. But if you're dragging ass, then the uh, reverse bucket will be in the water and so it will be more difficult to get the bucket to, to drop. So there you have my beginning thoughts on this. Um, as I said, there's still room for improvement, and because I'm the obsessive type, I will probably uh, continue looking at this. Uh, the main thing remaining is the cable routing, or maybe the quality of the cable itself. Uh, online I found some formulas for cable resistance. It tended to be something like, if the input force was 10 pounds, then you'd have to pull with 20 pounds of force if there was 360 degrees of, of bend. So what I was seeing on the chain test is if I hung maybe five pounds of chain from the bucket, then I had to push at least 10 times that much to move the helm. 
So something is up with the cable, or there's something else that I don't understand. So I'll have to figure that out. You know, this will happen sometime this winter, I assume. Another thing to reinforce is that a, a lot of my conclusions here are specific to a single lever helm. If you've got two levers, then things might not be so so good, particularly from a safety perspective. Maybe the bucket will drop or fly up because there's not any cam over in the two lever. But I've never looked at a two lever helm, so I don't actually know how much cam over there is. You know, maybe somebody else wants to do that, take a look at that, and post a video online. Then everyone will be more informed.